About five months ago, I was poking around the internet, as one does, when I found this vintage advertisement reading, For a healthy, happy job, join the Women's Land Army. The first thing I thought was how cool her outfit looked. Second was, what's the Women's Land Army? So I did some research, let's be honest, that means I read a Wikipedia article, and Sparknotes edition, it was a program from the British government during the World Wars that employed women to fill men's jobs while they're at war, growing food to support the mainland and the soldiers. A couple other countries had programs under the same name, I believe, but during the Second World War, the UK had a standard uniform that, although the fabrics differed due to shortages throughout the war, consisted of a couple simple and practical garments that the girls were allowed to keep one item from when it disbanded in 1950. So due to the number of reference photos on the internet and just how cool it looked, I figured this uniform would be a pretty cool one to make. As I said, historically many garments were handed out as part of the program, including a hat, coat, an armband, and a pin which they sell replicas of on eBay, but I don't want to pay shipping from the UK, and that's just the ones I remember off the top of my head. But in this video, I wanted to focus on the advertisement, so I only ended up making the blouse, sweater, and job purse. Here you can see the pattern for the blouse. This one I drafted myself and have been trying to perfect for the past couple months, and it's nearly there I'd say, except that neckline is still way too wide. It's just a simple yoke to button up blouse, I just chose to draft my own because I've had a difficult time finding patterns for or pre-made flattering blouses. I did reuse a couple pieces from another pattern I had, one that's vintage from the 40s, namely the collar and the sleeves. This is the fabric I chose to use. It's a cotton lawn which turned out to be a bit thin, but I guess that's what happens when you buy all your fabric online having never been to a fabric store before. I actually looked into it the other day, and there is zero fabric stores in my area, so I finally stopped procrastinating and watched a couple in-depth videos about fabric, taking notes, mind you, that I can maybe stop buying the exact opposite of what I need half the time. Anyway, I've been laying the pieces out on my fabric and pinning them. As I do that and begin to cut, since I have a ton of aesthetic clips that I cannot bear to part with and not much to say, I guess I could tell you guys about something super exciting that happened today. So I was at an antique store, you know, looking at Victorian fashion plates and the 18th century portraits and pictures of long dead children from 1870, the ones where they look really depressed, you know the ones, and I stumbled upon a shelf of fabric, yards of it. Most of the prints were super dated and mid-century looking, like just quilting cotton from the 70s, but they did have some red and green cotton plaid, which I thought was really pretty, and it was marked as a yard and a half for only 10 bucks, so I figured it was a great deal and just prayed it wasn't 20 inches wide. Anyway, when I got home, I went to check the width, and as I unfolded it, it just kept going. <laughs> I was seriously doubting it was only a yard and a half. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> it was two and a half yards of 45 inch width for $10. I was absolutely ecstatic and still am. I mean, that's enough to make any day dress as long as it's not like 1860. What I mean by that is it'll be plenty for any project from the 40s or 50s, which is what I'm interested in building a wardrobe from right now. Anyway, <laughs> that was kind of long, but all I've been doing is marking the darts onto the fabric using Taylor's chalk. After removing the pins, I was able to pin the darts, all four on the back. I believe I removed them all on the front, because the original pattern had front waist darts, which I removed early on because they weren't necessary, and for this pattern, I turned the bust darts into gathers. After sewing those, I was able to begin attaching the yoke to the front of the blouse. After gathering the top of the blouse using a long stitch length, I pinned the seam allowance on the yoke down. It was then basted into that position, and after the gathering stitches on the blouse were pulled to match, I was able to stitch on the yoke using top stitches. I could then remove the basting threads, which is literally the best feeling in the world. I don't baste a ton, but maybe I could convince myself to by just changing my attitude on it. Like, every time I baste, I get to remove the threads. Except if I stitch through them, then they're a real pain to get out. I was then able to pin the front and back side seams and shoulder seams together to prepare for sewing. Okay, so I kind of forgot I had footage of the sleeves in the collar, and also that that part of the process even existed, so I'm adding this section with a different mic after recording the real voiceover. Sorry about that, but I'm currently stitching the seams of the sleeves, then adding a gathering thread to them. 
Since I took this sleeve pattern from another blouse, the sleeves are a bit large for the arms I had drafted, probably because I drafted it without room for shoulder pads, as they wouldn't have done in my sleeve pattern. Then I set the sleeve, which I hate doing, the worst part is you have to do too. I always forget to place my pins vertically, which made it worse, but I really dislike sleeveless clothing, so it's a pain I'm willing to endure. After sewing that, I began on the collar. This piece came from the same blouse pattern as the sleeve, though I had to lengthen it a bit because for some reason, no matter how many mock-ups I did, the neckline was always too wide. And I cut the corners and used a crochet hook to poke them out like I did with the facing, which you'll see in a second. Then I pinned and sewed on the collar. Okay, sorry about that, back to better quality voiceover. After sewing all those, I could pin on the facing. Since the fabric's so thin, the facing can be seen really clearly from the outside of the blouse, which isn't ideal, but there really isn't much I can do about it save for remaking the blouse out of a different fabric. Since I was too lazy to make an actual pattern piece, I cut out the facing for the back of the blouse at the neckline. I probably should have cut this on the bias, and I thought I did, but I guess I forgot to. So that the facing turned neatly around the edges of the blouse, I clipped all the curves and corners. I feel like whenever I do this, I'm too afraid of clipping through the stitches, which I've done before, so it's always kind of ineffective. I then used a crochet hook to poke out the corners. When making the buttonholes, I messed up the first one, making it too close to the edge of the fabric. Every time I make buttonholes, I get scared I'll mess it up and do a test on some scrap fabric, except this time, and of course I messed up the direction in which the sewing machine moves. Thankfully, it was the bottom button that usually gets tucked into pants. I was then able to cut them open, which I also have a debilitating fear of, because one time I clipped through the buttonhole threads, which caused a bit of trouble and I had to try my best to hand stitch it back into place. Next, I stitched on corresponding buttons for the buttonholes. If you collect them for long enough, you'd be surprised how many free matching buttons you get with your clothing. I've been able to make several blouses just from free buttons. Lastly, I stitched the hem, which I probably should have turned over twice instead of once. For the pants, here's the brown corduroy I purchased. Due to the fabric shortages during the war, a range of colors were used for the uniforms, from tan to green to brown. I had some difficulty finding affordable corduroy, but I did eventually find this fabric dead stuck on Etsy, and it just happened to be the perfect shade of 70s brown that matched the ad. It is a bit of a thinner whale, but that's not a huge deal. Crozai Productions, a historical reproduction and short film company, I guess, recreated this outfit as well, and they actually examined one of these in the museum and wrote a blog post about it, so the measurements and pictures were really helpful to me. I just chose not to make a lining to save on costs and effort, even though the original had one. I drafted this pattern myself, based on the only free pants pattern I could think of, which was a Victorian pattern from the Keystone Guide to Jacket and Dress Cutting, available for free on archive.org. The 1890s silhouette really aided in creating the shape of the jodhpurs, because it gave me a lot of extra room in the hips. However, I had to get rid of a lot of the Victorian-ness, which probably took about four mock-ups. I'll put some photos on the screen as I pin and cut the pieces of how they evolved from mock-up to mock-up. Once I was done perfecting the fit, I put all of the style lines and pocket details onto the piece, which were really fun to make. In total, I ended up cutting two back pieces, two front pieces, two waistbands cut on the fold, it'll make more sense when you see me put it together, belt loops, which I ended up being too lazy to make, two pocket facings, and another set of pocket facing-ish pieces. I then marked the four waist starts onto the main pieces using Taylor's chalk. I can't quite remember, but I think the front pieces on the original didn't have waist starts, but I wasn't quite sure how to remove them when altering the pattern, and it's not a huge deal anyway. After sewing the darts, I started with the details on the front. It gets a bit complicated, so I'll make some sort of diagram to illustrate what I'm sewing to what as I do it. As of writing the script, that's not something I've done so far, so if I mess up in the voiceover, I'll put a correction on the screen. So here are my two waistband pieces. As you can see, they go across the front and seam in the middle. The back of the pants don't have a waistband. So the first thing I did was pin and sew the waistband piece to the weird facing that isn't actually a facing by definition, I think, so I'll call it the triangle piece. Oh, and just to clarify, there are a few discrepancies between the ad and the real thing. Since I had the blog post, I figured I could make it like the original. 
Next, the pocket facing was stitched to the back pocket pieces. This one is a real facing, unlike our triangle friend, so its purpose is to prevent the pocket fabric from showing when you open the pocket. These pieces were sewn to the main front piece of the pants. A slightly shorter pocket piece was attached to the triangle in the waistband, so they lined up nicely. So this will be how it fits together, except not quite because I stitched the triangle to the wrong side of the waistband. After quickly fixing that, it laid together properly, I just wasn't holding the main piece at the right angle. I then stitched the bit on the main piece to the left of the dart to the part on the waistband the triangle wasn't covering. All that was left to do was stitch the two pocket pieces together. I played around with my mock-ups a lot so that I knew the most efficient way to stitch these pieces together in order to prevent them from getting in my way, and I have to say, I'm really pleased with how it came out. As you can see, the pocket's completely functional, and the gap between the main front piece and the triangle piece at the side to form a complete pocket will be seamed shut when we do the side seams. I top stitched around many of these seams off camera to neaten them up a bit, as I wasn't sure how to iron corduroy without killing the corduroy knits. Since the details on the front pieces were finished, I could stitch the front and back seams on the pants together. It's pretty basic, just some aesthetic pinning clips and some non-aesthetic sewing machine sections, so I'll take a minute to mention the absolute banger of a song that's playing right now. This song, and a couple others in this video, were composed and recorded by my friend Carter, who has a channel here on YouTube with lots of really interesting music-related content, from covers to jazz improv to song analysis and composition, so I would really appreciate it if you took a look. Link is in the description box. Anyway, here's one of the side seams of the pants, and we're going to use plackets and buttons to close on both sides. For those who don't know, a placket is a flap of fabric sewn at the closure to help reinforce the fabric or provide an anchor for the buttons, hooks and eyes, or any other type of closure to sit. For this pattern, we'll need a piece to face the front of the pants on the inside to provide more support for making the buttonholes, which I'm cutting and pinning right now, and a flap extending out from the back of the pants to sew buttons to. You can see here how it's double the width of the other piece and extends past the edge of the fabric. When the pants are closed, this will sit against the other facing, allowing the buttons and buttonholes to meet. And like on the original, these plackets are on both sides of the pants. After that was finished, I stitched the side seams together below the plackets. In order to finish the back edge, which didn't have a waistband, I cut a facing piece from my remaining corduroy, which I pinned and stitched to the raw edge before turning it to the inside and felling it down. It doesn't provide the rigidity of a real waistband, which I kind of wish it did, but it works to finish the edge. Next, I top stitched around the top edge and also went around the base of the front waistband piece. I sewed on buttonholes next, using the buttons I planned to use for scale and spacing. Thankfully, I didn't mess up any of these buttonholes. Again, I sewed the buttons to the back placket. I got these really cheaply off Amazon, they're just standard wooden buttons. I forgot to leave room for the hem, so I had to make them really narrow. In the advertisement, they get tucked into socks, so it's not a huge deal. The last thing I did was make eyelets using embroidery thread at the cuffs of the pants. Aside from the fact that I was using a mechanical pencil to make the holes, I'm not too happy with how these came out because maybe it was just the corduroy, but they were really small. It made threading the suede cord I'd bought through the holes really difficult, which I didn't film because of a set difficulty. You don't want to see it anyway, it was really messy and I was listening to Blue Suede Shoes, the Carl Perkins version mind you, on repeat while dying inside for a good 40 minutes. At least the eyelets themselves looked pretty. With that, the pants were finished. I did crochet a ribbed sweater as well, but it wasn't my own pattern so I figured it wasn't interesting enough to film. I'm actually really happy with how this project came out, the only complaints I have are with the sweater, and that I didn't add belt loops to the pants. Yet still, two months later, I haven't gotten around to doing it. It's fine, I'll do it eventually. I think the blouse could use some shoulder pads, because it's the 40s, but I'm not sure if the pattern has room for them, so it's not a big deal. Also, the neckline is still a bit wide, even after all my adjustments in the mock-ups, but we'll get them eventually, boys. Alright, that's about it for this video. Thanks so much for watching, and if you enjoyed, feel free to subscribe for more content like this. I'll see you guys next time.